is Dominic Satterberg. Um, I shoot sports for a living and I absolutely love it. I'm actually gonna just show kind of a, I got a little 90 second teaser here that I shot um, at an XFL game that I'll just kind of start with to kind of set the tone of what this thing is all about. The XFL is back, guys, didn't, if you didn't know. Um, <laughs> I remember the XFL in 2001 when it was owned by the WWE. Um, I shoot a lot, of course, of American football. Um, the NFL is my number one client. I shoot a lot for NFL films. Um, but when I was able to get a credential to an XFL game up in Seattle, uh, I took my camera and a couple lenses and I thought, hey, football in the spring, I like that. Um, so. This is kind of what we're gonna go over today. Kind of brief, brief little bit about my history and how I got to where I am today. Um, kind of the philosophy that I have kind of adopted from NFL films about shooting sports and why we shoot sports with kind of cinema equipment um, as, as kind of a baseline. Um, get a little bit into the cameras, get a lot into the lenses. Um, and I've got a little slide about just some of the general techniques that I use when covering primarily football, but it can be used for any kind of sport, um, and then we'll wrap up. Please st stop me if I, if I go too fast. If you have a question, don't wait to the end. An ask at any time. It's a small group of people. I want to make sure you guys get value out of this. So as the emojis state, I love shooting sports. I've truly found um, my passion, um, and I found that at an early age, which doesn't happen to a lot of people, which is, which is good. Um, going to um, 49er games as a California native, binoculars, looking at the sidelines, noticing that there's guys with cameras on their shoulders that don't have cables running um, away from the cameras. Um, when I started, in about 2002, I was in junior college and, and I noticed NFL films on the sidelines at 49er games and they were still shooting film, 16 millimeter film, 2002. And I was like, wow, hey, I want to go to film school. I want to learn how to do this filmmaking thing because I had no one in my family who shot sports, was into motion picture stuff. So I needed to learn how to do that. Um, and so junior college led to Art Center College of Design in Pasadena, got a BFA in film and cinematography, and I learned the craft of cinematography. Didn't learn anything, but I never shot sports, but I knew I wanted to shoot sports. So my baseline was like cinematography first and then how do I learn how to shoot sports? Um, <laughs> internship, internship with NFL Films in 2006. Um, right out of college, unpaid. Thankfully, interns today get paid. Um, but yes, a 2006 unpaid internship with NFL Films changed the trajectory of my career. Um, and let me get my little keynote app here. So I do a lot of other things too. Um, as it pertains to sports. Um, I get hired a lot because of my connections with NFL Films to do other NFL productions, um, which has a lot to do with Omaha Productions, which is Peyton Manning's production company, which kind of partners a lot with NFL Films. So 
I've been a part of Peyton's places, Eli's places, Vince Carter places, um, shot a, a series of Hard Knocks when it was in Oakland. Um, yeah, NFL Films Presents, earning it, and then a couple Netflix shows. Um, Film 45 did a show called QB1 on Netflix. They've also did a sh recently a show on Showtime called Boys in Blue. I get brought in to just shoot football. So there's, there's a DP who does all the interviews. Um, they call someone like me and other colleagues to just come in and shoot the games. Um, everything on you see here, we shoot on Ari uh, Amira's, except when it comes to Film 45, they shoot on FX9s and FS7s. Now it's FX9s. Um, and I'll get into kind of why the Amira is kind of the premier sports camera. Um, but just so you know, I can shoot it all, but I really prefer to use my Amira because I'll get into that in a little bit. So 16 seasons. I feel like a, a veteran. <laughs> uh, 16 NFL seasons, over 300 NFL games, and I've uh, been a part of 13 Super Bowls, and I've listed the numbers of Super Bowls <laughs> that I've been to. There's a, there's a gap there where I missed some, and it's kind of like you're waiting to get that call around November for the FBI background check to work a Super Bowl. Sometimes it doesn't come, and you're like, man, did I have a crappy season? But sometimes it's in far away from me. If you're living in California, sometimes it's far away, so you just can't take it personal, but I'm super excited to just wrapped up my 13th Super Bowl in Phoenix, where the Chiefs, um, yet again, won another Super Bowl. It's becoming a theme. Um, just so you know, I talk a lot about NFL films, but not a lot of people maybe are familiar with what we do. Um, I am not an employee of the NFL. I'm a freelance cinematographer, so they call me, I shoot a football game, I, they rent my camera, they rent my lenses, and then I can do other things. I'm just a big fan of NFL films, still to this day. Um, so this is what we see when we watch it live. This is what we produce at NFL films. Same game, different cameras, different lenses. This particular game in 2021, um, we had four cameras at. I was shooting uh, long lens, prime lenses on the sideline. We had what we call a sync sound crew, which is a cameraman and a sound man or woman um, with a boom mic. They're capturing that stuff. Um, so we have 120 frames. I was also shooting 60 frames. There's a 48 frame, which is that shot. Daniel Murphy out of San Francisco. Um, and then there's always a top shot, which I'll get into kind of the lenses for that. But minimum, there's always going to be two cameras covering an NFL game for NFL films. The broadcast might have 17. There's just two for NFL films on a normal game. One on the ground, one in the press box. This, in 2021, was a pretty big game, week three. So they said they, they brought in more resources because the bigger the game, the more crews. So I cut my teeth really shooting um, ground level action, so from the sidelines, covering the game. Um, let me just go back. The 13, 17 cameras, however many um, NBC had this game. Of course, if anybody shot live sports, you have a nice headset and someone yells at you. <laughs> and um, with NFL films, no one yells at you unless you didn't get the shot the next day. Um, there's no one telling us what to shoot. I get a call sheet with a frame rate and what lens I'm supposed to be working, and then I just go have fun. Um, and then the, the stress level is high because you want to be able to get the good shots. You want to ISO Devontae Adams and hopefully they throw the ball to him. Um, so then you keep ISOing Devontae Adams until they do throw the ball to him. Um, but then you're missing other plays. Um, so live broadcast, which we absolutely need, which is a huge part of any sporting event. Um, but then there's kind of what I call the, the art form um, of sports cinematography, and that's NFL films. So if you're not familiar with kind of the history of NFL films, in the early 60s, a man named Ed Sable, an overcoat salesman out of Philadelphia, um, <laughs> found out that the rights to shoot the NFL championship game, which is now known as the Super Bowl, um, was sold for $1,500, those rights to a production company. And so in 1962, he found that out, and he was a pretty good overcoat salesman, and he paid $3,000 for the 1962 rights to be able to shoot the 62 championship game. He didn't have a film company. He didn't, <laughs> as he said in many, many interviews, uh, the only experience he had was shooting his, son, his son's peewee football games. 
Um, but he was a great leader, and he found the right camera guys, and they did end up shooting the 62 championship game, and they never looked back. Um, in 1967, in 62, they formed a company called Blair Motion Pictures, which is named after Ed's daughter. So he had Steve Sable, his daughter Blair Sable. He called it Blair Motion Pictures. And in 67, the league acquired Blair Motion Pictures. And so NFL Films became a part of the league in 67. And so NFL Films is the production leg of the National Football League. Since then, other partners have been NFL Network, NFL Media, website. It's all one big happy family. Um, but I, I have a couple of clips about Steve Sable's philosophy, which of course gets ingrained into us as NFL film shooters. Um, again, I was a fan of NFL films before I started shooting for NFL films. I guess growing up as an elder millennial, um, I didn't realize what I was watching was NFL films. And maybe that happened to a lot of us. Like I didn't realize it was shot on film. And I, I just know that Dwight Clark made a catch in 1981, and I can close my eyes and I can picture that shot of his hands coming up, but I just thought that was on TV, but it wasn't. It was, it was NFL film shot that, that I kind of remember. Um, so here's a little clip from Steve. So if someone were to ask me, how would I define our job at NFL Films? I'd say it is to bring a new understanding and a new perspective to something that's already been seen. Uh, to give a creative treatment to reality. So, because even back then, this was a clip from the 70s, um, it's, it's a live sporting event. Everybody knows the outcome. Everybody knows the score. Why the heck are they going to watch your film? Um, and so, him having this, this great understanding of what the role of NFL films is and was, is to essentially give people access that they didn't have when they watched the live show give them the stories that they didn't know about when they were watching the live broadcast. Because they're watching it, of course, to see their team win or lose. Um, but what NFL Films does with one piece of it, of course, is the cinematography, audio, microphones, music, editing. It's a film. And we do that with every game of every season since 1962. So, um, so Ernie Ernst, one of the first staff cinematographers so, like I said, I'm a freelance cinematographer. There's probably 60 of us across the country that do freelance. Um, and then there's about eight in-house staff cinematographers. Um, Ernie was one of those original ones. Um, Ernie made, I want to say he came from the golf world. And so Steve Sable kind of handpicked him because he could follow a golf ball. <laughs> and so if you can follow a golf ball, you can follow football, right? Um, Ernie would shoot a Photosonics Super 16 high-speed film camera with a 400 millimeter prime and shoot a whole football game with a prime lens. Um, and they called him The Rock. He uh, had shots like the Immaculate Reception, Ghost of the Post, Old Man Willie in the Super Bowl with the Raiders. Um, it's just, uh, it's an interesting way to shoot a football game. I challenge any, anybody to shoot just a prime lens. Don't switch lenses um, in a football game. He'd post up in the end zone and just have a day, have an absolute day. So uh, this quote, I love it. We didn't get everyone, meaning shots, but boy, the ones we got were special. And, and again, if you've ever shot a prime lens at a sporting event, you don't get everyone. <laughs> but the ones you do get are special. And I'll kind of talk about that 400 millimeter setup in a little bit. Another one from the late, great Steve Sable, who, who passed away in 2012, but ran the company <coughs> for over four decades. Cezanne said that all art is selected detail. And when we started NFL Films, that was something that I thought was missing in all sports cinematography. To me, I wanted to get the storytelling shots of the way the, the, the sun came through the stadium, the cleat marks in the mud, the, the, the bloody hands of a player. That was what I shot as a cameraman. We had other cameramen who were great action photographers. But to me, I wanted to get those little details that, that, that added onto the action would, would, would flesh out the story. Flesh out the story. That's exactly what we do. And that mentality, um, because Steve Sable was, uh, was an artist at heart, again, infused all the way through that whole building in Mount Lowell, New Jersey, and then, of course, then through us freelancers all over the country. 
Um, and, and, it, and that's what makes this company so special. Again, I feel like this is a pitch for NFL Films, but I, I truly do love what, what I get to be able to do. Um, and I, and I'm, I'm a huge fan of this company and Steve Sable. The cameras, question? No, okay. Um, so 1962, video wasn't invented, or maybe it was, but it, it, we were, they were shooting film from 1962 to 2013. So this is what I look like from 2007 when I started shooting to 2013 before we switched to digital. This is an Airflex SR2 camera with a, at that point we were shooting video lenses. Um, you see the clip of Steve with one of those old 16 millimeter cameras and an old probably 10 to 100 um, 16 millimeter zoom. Uh, we, we evolved and uh, they went to the ENG um, B4 mount 2 3rd inch sensor lenses that were adapted to a Super 16 film. So this camera, I believe started out as a 16 millimeter camera. It then was converted to a Super 16 camera, which that magnetic strip on a film, on, it used to have audio on the right side of a film strip in 16 millimeter. Didn't need that anymore with the advancements in digital audio. So they took that uh, magnetic stripe off the film, opened up the film gate a little bit more. Now we had widescreen 16 by nine Super 16 millimeter film on the same 16 millimeter film that we had been shooting for years. Um, this is a 400 foot magazine. I would get eight 400 foot rolls a game. And if I went over eight, I'd get a phone call <laughs> on Monday morning, which is not fun. So I don't know if you've ever tried to shoot a sporting event and actually limit yourself on what you shoot. Um, in, the, in the old days, back in the 60s and 70s, Ed Sable said, let the, let the film run like water but as film got more and more expensive, as we're creeping up to 2013, um, it, we couldn't let it run like water. Um, and so uh, my, again, my kind of, I cut my teeth at 48 frames a second and 60 frames a second, shooting, covering the game. And so a lot of the times I'm the only one on the field. And then up in the press box, we had similar camera, but with a 25 by lens, this was a 22 by at the time, a 25 by covering the top angle. Um, rest in peace to Qualcomm Stadium in San Diego, but that was, I want to say the last playoff game there, Jets versus Chargers in 2009. Um, and that is a Optex 5.5 uh, wide angle lens, which I would use uh, pre-game and post-game to get those amazing low angle shots of people coming on and off the field. Um, and then I would switch to a 22 by to shoot the action. Any questions? Does anybody still shoot film? Yes, I do. Like, uh, still or? Nice. Yes, yes. It's expensive, isn't it? <laughs> so, um, so yeah. Up until 2013, we were the oddballs with light meters on sidelines, and we were shooting um, film. And right at the end there, I want to say the NFL was spending fifty thousand dollars a week just on film. So, and that's just to buy the film. And then, of course, we shoot it. They had everything in-house. So it would, it would get couriered back from every NFL stadium the, that night after a football game, make it back to Philadelphia, which would then be transported to Mount Laurel, New Jersey. It would be then developed and processed and transferred to digital, telecine process, color corrected. So then an editor on Monday morning or Tuesday morning could start editing it for the first show on Wednesday nights uh, inside the NFL. So it was quite the operation, and they did that from 62 to 2013, um, and yeah. So then we went to Super 35, and we, we got to play with Amiras. So the Amira um, is the Airy camera that is built for documentary shooting. It is a shoulder-mounted camera. It has the same sensor as an Airy Alexa, um, which came out in 2010. So it took Aerie four years to kind of come out with a $100,000 Aerie Alexa and make it a $50,000 Aerie Amira with built-in NDs, um, the ability to record to CFast 2.0 cards, um, 200 frames a second. You could shoot 4K, but that is not a traditional 4K sensor, which is why we have the Alexa 35 now, um, which we're still shooting Amiras because everything we shoot is still 1080p, 1080p today. Um, no need for 4K. We shoot eight terabytes every Sunday. 
um, and, we, and we just shoot 1080p. And that all has to be wirelessly transferred via fiber from every NFL stadium back to Mount Laurel, New Jersey. So it's a little bit quicker than uh, a courier taking the film back to NFL films. Um, but yeah, so typical frame rates are gonna be 30 frames. Everything gets delivered in 24, but 30 frames, 48 frames, 60 frames, 120 frames. Um, and of course, when we have a sound assignment, we're gonna be at 23976 with our sound man. Uh, just, this was in 2014, um, we all got invited out. The very first 30 area mirrors to come from Germany, from ARI, um, were earmarked for NFL films. Um, and the, and the, the real push for this, I think we would have shot film in 2014 if one thing hadn't happened. Flagship show inside the NFL on HBO for decades, I think switched to uh, Showtime. And they didn't have a Wednesday night time slot. They had a Tuesday night time slot. Well, when you shoot film, that kind of forces your hand to say, we can't shoot film and deliver on Wednesday night. We got to, if we, or Tuesday night. So we need to speed up that process. So thankfully, Ari had developed that camera and we all switched and got a cool little training seminar in Mount Laurel, New Jersey to, um, at the headquarters to understand what the heck we were doing. Cause we're all film guys. You know, we had film loaders at every game. Um, we had light meters and so we needed to figure out how to do this. It's amazing that that camera came out in 2014 and we still use it today in 2023. Um, I'm assuming the Alexa 35 is on the horizon, but for now, that Amira is still kicking butt. I mean, you think about what else came out in 2014, like a 7D Mark II, who still uses one of those? Um, but we still use these cameras from 2014. I was fortunate enough to, to buy a used one in 2019. Um, so now I own my own. And so the NFL, of course, rents it, rents it from me um, when I shoot games. And that was a really, really, it was a, it was a tough decision with my wife, but it was a great decision uh, for my career because then I could, I could shoot more than just the NFL with it. And it, it truly is the best sports camera because of that eyepiece. I give credit to anybody who could pull focus on a, on a football or any kind of flying object on a monitor or an LCD screen. An EVF is, is the bread and butter of trying to follow a football or any other object. Um, I, I did about six and a half years at Fresno State, um, and they're all A7S3s with 70 to 200 lenses. It's full frame. It's, 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 not, it's not ideal to shoot football. They do a great job, and they have really great shooters who, who do that with a mirrorless camera and a 7200 photo lens, but it's, it's extremely hard to get the shots that we want to get at NFL Films. So an EVF is, is very, and even with the um, Peter Berg company, Film 45, it's FX9s with some Zacuto eyepiece or even just a Sony eyepiece. You whip and it, it, there's a lag. And it's extremely hard to follow a football. So every time I work with them, I was like, can I bring my Amira? I won't even charge you for it because it helps me shoot sports better. So, yes, so some of the setups. Um, Fresno State basketball, Fresno State football, Super Bowl 56 in LA. Um, and again, I'll get into kind of the lenses um, that we gotta choose. Oh, what I wanted to talk about briefly on this slide was why I think Super 35 is here to stay in the sports world. Um, I, can't, I can't see a world where we're shooting full frame um, anytime soon. I know the Alexa LF is, is a great camera for the motion picture industry, but we need lenses that get out very, very far. And when you talk about large sensor cameras, the lenses that fill those sensors need to be extremely large. Um, and so, of course, I had one of those shots of that 25 to 300, which is a super 35 lens. Um, and so those are the type of lenses you would need to kind of fill the full frame sensor. Um, with the adapters that we use and the lenses that we use, super 35, in my opinion, is here to stay. And you can tell that when Ari released a brand new super 35 camera, um, the Alexa 35, which I'm hoping there'll be an Amira 2.0 with that same sensor. Um, they, if you go over to the booth, they can't confirm that. Um, but I keep nudging them because, again, we're at a $100,000 price point for an Alexa 35. Well, I don't want to spend that. No, neither does the NFL. 
give us a $50,000 price point, which is where this one lands, um, and take some of the anamorphic stuff out and take all that, the bells and whistles out and just give us that sensor with a shoulder mounted camera. Plus, get into the, some of the prime lenses, oh shoot, some of the prime lenses that we use, I use a lot of full frame glass. Well, shooting sports, now I get 1.5 more, you know? And so having the full frame glass is actually nice on a Super 35 sensor because I'm able to get further on the field without losing any light or an extender. So, of course I do use extenders on full frame glass, but we'll get into that in a sec. So, the workhorse lens um, is the Fujinon 24 by 2 3rd inch ENG zoom plus that little, little $5,000 adapter that takes that 2 3rd inch image from that lens and expands it to Super 35. It's a great adapter. It's not ideal. Um, it's what we use every single, you, you will find a 22 by a 23 by a 24 by at every NFL game. Whether that's on the broadcast camera that's shooting the live broadcast or for NFL films. Um, our secondary lenses when we get to do the pretty art stuff is um, usually with cinema glass, but there's nothing that has come out yet um, that can compete with that lens. It's weight, it's size, it's throw. So on the barrel of this lens, I wanna say, if you're shooting on a traditional 2 3rd inch broadcast camera, you're at 7.8 millimeters to 172 millimeters. Well, expand that with that ex adapter. There's a math problem there, I'm not good at math, but figure 20 mil to like 450 mil. That's kind of what we're getting out of that lens. Now it comes at a cost, I'm losing a lot of light because of that, and I'm potentially muddying up the image. It's not as crisp as if I had that 25 to 300 or any cinema glass on it, but it helps us get where we need to go. Um, and so there's a, one, of our, our, one of the greatest shooters ever was a man named Donnie Marks who's since retired. Um, the things he can do with this lens will blow anybody's mind. Um, and so he set the standard for the best in the business. Um, and then a younger kid named Austin Porter who's been with NFL Films for about 10 years, the things he can do with this lens are absolutely amazing. Um, so if you search YouTube for Austin Porter, somehow he was able to get all of his um, five-star clips from NFL Films and he put together a 10-minute reel and it is all shot on this lens. And when I talk about muddying up the image or it's not ideal, you look at it and you go, okay, <laughs> that looks amazing. And so because it's a ENG zoom and because it's made for such a small sensor, the focus throw is not very much. I mean, when we're on the cinema glass and we need to zoom from here to there, we're cranking the focus throw. On this, I have a couple clips of kind of behind the scenes, but you'll watch my fingers. It's just, it's just ever so slightly, you know? I could tap this way and I've already adjusted 10, 20 feet, you know? And it's like, so there's a muscle memory to try and follow footballs with this, but it's really, the gold standard for following sports action. It's not ideal, it's not the prettiest, but um, it gets the job done. Any questions? Yeah? Um, does film push one way or the other on like? It is, is operator um, preference. So the first part of my career in some of those uh, shots when I had that 60 millimeter camera, I was all servo. Because that's kind of how I came, in, came into the world. I'm on the grip um, and then I kind of um, I'll talk about the 25 by next, but I was in playoffs and Super Bowls, I was switched to a 25 by, and they had removed all the servos off of those because that's how the top shooters shoot is just kind of this thumb and pinky focus action. So I kind of became accustomed to that. So about halfway through my career, I switched to just no servo, just hand, my left hand. And so it doesn't matter. Some of the best shooters, um, uh, Kayline Shounce, Pat Maher out of the Midwest, there's servo guys in there at every Super Bowl. You know, they, they're getting stuff that is amazing because they've really perfected the zoom rocker on those lenses. So when I talk about that adapter, um, I'm really talking the two third inch broadcast standard is here. And of course, this is not actual scale, <laughs> but <laughs> if it was, that'd be amazing. Um, so we need to expand, when we were shooting on the SR2s and SR3s, we needed just to get to this box, right? So Super 16. 
So that's where that um, other adapter called an abacus came into play. So just a slight expansion, a little bit of light loss, great, um, great adapter. And then we needed to go to the Alexa sensor. Um, and so you can see it's quite a big, almost three times, two, two and a half times um, the size of a two third inch. So that's what that area adapter does. There's another company called IBE Optics who makes an HD35 adapter, which is probably the same exact adapter, but one is sold by Airy and one is um, IBE Optics. Um, that does the same thing. And this I think is 1.4, and then this is like two and a half from here to here, um, which of course comes at a cost with that light loss. Uh, by the way, these are from um, Abel Cine's website. They're a great resource um, if you're ever looking into what, what coverage does this lens give me? Um, so the, the image circle too. So the two third inch lens creates that 11 millimeter circle. Super 16s, 15 mil. Super 35, 32. Um, but I think on that Alexa sensor, we can get away with like a 28, 29 millimeter image circle. And I'll get into that when I talk about the 20 to 120. Any questions? So the 24 by, if I'm shooting the 24 by, which I don't own, so they're really pushing the 24 by because it is coded for UHD. It's, it's got the best coatings. It's a 4K, two third inch sensor lens. Um, so you can always kind of tell it's a 24 by because that barrel is bigger than a 23 by or 22 by. Um, and again, there's that area adapter to, to fit the uh, PL mount and expand the image. Um, so this was a Jimmy Garoppolo wire in San Francisco a couple years ago. Um, and so I love using that. The player's wearing a microphone. I need to be smooth. Can't be herky-jerky. The nice thing about shooting slow motion is that I can be herky-jerky because everything is just pretty and slows down and it's not so um, jarring. But when you're shooting 23.976 uh, frame rates and you need to follow that player for the entire game, a hi-hat and a Preston Micro Force gets the job done. Of course, when Jimmy comes off the field, goes to the bench, I click off the hi-hat and I go handheld um, and I shoot all his stuff on the bench handheld. Okay, so a little bit into uh, shooting technique. We talked about the servo. So if you don't shoot servo, I kind of, I like doing this and if you follow me kind of on Instagram or any other social platform, Twitter, um, I like to post these kind of behind the scenes because these are the things that I wish I had for people like Donnie Marks. Um, the world's best sports shooter, man, just put, put a GoPro on top of your camera. I just wanna see what your hands are doing. I wanna see how you're able to capture um, what you're able to capture. So this is a Fresno State game, of course. This is at real time. This is at 120 frames. Um, but I actually love looking at it on the projector too because minimal, minimal, just that ENG zoom, just minimal taps on the zoom, on the focus, um, get you where you need to be. You can see that ball's flying through there. It's, it's such a minimal, um, but it's, just, it's, it's muscle memory at this point. Um, and yeah, and so I've got a pistol grip kind of underneath the zoom rocker. And so I, I've, I've really dialed in that Amira now that I own it to just fit perfectly on my shoulder. It's all about balance. Early in my career, I, I wasn't, the SR2 couldn't really do what the new cameras can do with the base plate sliding, the top handle sliding. And um, so hopefully uh, the quarterback here, Jake Hayner, gets drafted this week. We'll see. So the 25 by um, is pictured here with a servo, but no 25 by that NFL Films has ever comes with a servo. Um, and again, you need the adapter to do so. They've also disabled, uh, so the lens tech at NFL Films has disabled the two times extender um, because he doesn't want anybody using it. Because if you flip the two times extender on this lens and you have already this on it, you wanna talk about muddy image, it's unusable. Um, so they've completely disabled the two times extender on every single one of their lenses so you don't accidentally hit it. Um, and again, the 25 by, at every NFL game will be from this position, which is a top position shooting the play, which is gonna be a tighter shot than what you see on broadcast, but these guys who shoot uh, up top are definitely artists themselves because I can kind of have fun on the ground, but they've gotta get every shot because I'm not gonna get every shot. Um, and so I love our top guys, and if you're a top guy, you're not a ground guy. 
If you're a ground guy, you're not a top guy. Um, it's just kind of how NFL films works because it's kind of a different mentality. Um, and then when the playoffs come around, they have all these extra 25 buys because you just went from 16 games a weekend to four. Um, and so we add, of course, more cameras for the playoffs. And so then I take a 25 buy and shoot what we call a home run camera. Um, a home run camera is what you're kind of seeing in this bottom right corner. Um, sometimes Kaepernick kisses his bicep in front of you. Um, but I, it, yes, you can get tight with it, but because I'm always away from the action, there's other guys shooting tight. Um, so the wide stuff actually gets used more than the tight stuff when I shoot this. Um, a little bit of backstory on the home run camera. Super Bowl 43, the Steelers are playing the Cardinals. Um, Kurt Warner throws an interception at the goal line. He's about to score. James Harrison, number 92, intercepts the ball and runs 102 yards. He stumbles and bumbles 102 yards to score for the, for the Pittsburgh Steelers right before halftime. And there wasn't one NFL Films camera in the opposite end zone. So the VP at the time, Hank McElwee, said, we've got to have a camera back there. And we're going to call it the home run camera. So Super Bowl 44 was the first home run camera for NFL Films. Um, I didn't start shooting it probably until the, the following year when they introduced it to every playoff game. Um, and it, it really is a, an angle that they're not used to having. I mean, we've been doing it now for 10 years. Um, but every Super Bowl, that's what I do. Every playoff game, that's usually what I do. Um, and yeah, the 25 by helps me get that done. Now this year, um, I made it, because again, we love shooting these video lenses, but if we can shoot cinema glass, I'll be the first to try cinema glass. So I reached out to the new um, head of cinematography and said, could we try some cinema for the home run? Because it's, you don't, you're not gonna use it for every play. Um, when you switch to cinema glass, of course, we're talking about shallower depth of field. It's har harder to follow football. But when I'm getting these postcard shots and blocked off things, I could kind of have some fun with a cinema lens. Um, and so we went to the 30 to 300 for the wild card game, uh, Seahawks at Niners, and then for the Super Bowl, um, Tom Fletcher over at Fujinon sent me a 25 to 300, um, and so I shot that for the Super Bowl. And I, it may be here to stay. The 25 by may be done as a home run camera, but we'll see. It's very, very heavy when you switch to, of course, that cinema glass, because I need to run from that end zone as the play starts coming towards me, and if all the films camera guys are now surrounding me, I gotta go to the other end zone. So every time I move, it's 120 yards. So having a light camera with the 25 by is a lot easier to do. Um, but I was up for the challenge to run with a 30 to 300 for the wild card game. The Airy 100 millimeter Ultra Prime. What you'll find here, it's kind of a hodgepodge of just random lenses. And that's kind of what I love about NFL films. We don't, I mean, yes, we're kind of loyal to Fujinon because they do create some great zoom lenses. Um, but again, if we can start using more cinema glass, um, kind of the better those art shots become. Um, and so not a lot of people use the 180 Ultra Prime. So of course, you've got your 32, your 50, your 65, your 85. Um, but the 180 is the uh, long lost older brother of the Ultra Prime series. And um, it's a lens that I purchased a couple years ago and absolutely love. Um, paired with uh, a, an IBE Optics 2 times extender, you can get a lot of great stuff because now you've doubled the focal length. But both of these shots um, I shot with no 2 times extender. Top right corner, um, Browns at Chiefs divisional playoff game a couple years ago during the pandemic. Uh, wasn't allowed on the field. It's actually kind of nice. We only had limited. Um, field access because of COVID. Um, but you could tell who Andy Reid is just by looking at the back of his head. And so the, the head coach is there framed up perfectly. It actually was a shot where Mahomes got hurt. So it was, it was kind of a big play in the game. Chad Henney had to come in and, and win the game. But um, absolutely love the uh, 180 mil when I get to use it. Again, it's, I can't shoot a normal ground uh, action with it because it, I'm going to miss a lot going back to what Ernie said. Um, but when I can use it and I'm on a specialty assignment, I love to have it in my kit um, and, and be able to use it.
some of those shots from the 49er game in the earlier part of my presentation was two lenses. It was a 180 mil ultra prime and it was the 400 millimeter Canon FD, which I'll get into. Any questions? So another super zoom, <laughs> so wide angle zoom that we use. This is a $300 Tokina lens that Matthew Duclos, who's actually speaking next door, um, and his company have rehoused to make it a $1,900 lens um, and made it a PL mount and uh, rehoused it with the Cine gears so you can add focus motors. This is such a great lens. I mean, even at $1,900, it's totally worth it because to have 11 mil on your mirror, it's back, it goes back to those film days when we had a 5.5 millimeter, which is equivalent, right? You have a Super 16 at 5.5, and you have a Super 35 at 11, it's pretty much the same lens. Um, but this lens is fun post-game, um, so I'm usually throwing off my 23 by. So I don't own a 24 by, I use a 23 by that I bought off eBay. Works great, love eBay lenses. Um, but I take the 23 by off and I slap the 11 to 16 on and I get all the post-game shots. Rest in peace, Oakland Raiders. <laughs> Um, and then pregame, love it for pregame, just to get those um, slow motion shots, um, following players. It has a nice kind of flare aspect. It's, again, it's not a cinema glass, it's a photo lens, um, but it, it, it has some really cool characteristics. And again, I just love it because it is so wide. I, I do tend to use it on the 11 mil and don't even go into the 16, um, but it's such a short zoom, it's hard to tell. Questions? I mean, I can't, this one's also another one of my favorites. Um, the 20 to 120, another eBay find for me, um, has a smaller image circle than its bigger brother, the 19 to 90. The 19 to 90 sells for about twice as much. Um, the 19 to 90 is a T2.9. So we're losing some light by buying this lens. We're losing some image circle by buying this lens, but it's about half the price. Um, and so, because we only shoot 1080p, um, this lens is perfect on most cameras. Even 4K on my FS7 II, it's fine. But when you get into UHD on an Alexa Mini or an Amira, you'll see some vignetting in UHD mode on this lens. Um, so yeah, a little, little bit of music here. Shot a little Adidas stuff. When President State switched from Nike to Adidas, they wanted, hey, you've got like, a minute with every player. Okay, well, I'm gonna bring my zoom lens. So I'm gonna bring my 20 to 120 and uh, get some of the Adidas stuff, zooming in, going wide. That lens is perfect for this stuff. Um, and I love it too, um, again, another thing that's always in my bag is an IBE Optics two times extender, which is PL to PL, and it makes that a 40 to 240, which then will cover Super 35 um, in UHD on my Amira, probably full frame too. Um, so I'll use this lens at NFL games if I have a sound man or sound woman with me, um, and we're getting bench sound similar to that Packers highlight where you're, you're there with them when they score touchdowns, you get the jubilation, you're getting them speaking behind the bench. This lens is great, even just shoot it wide open because you get that nice fall off at T3.5. Um, and yeah, so shoot, great basketball lens too. Um, underneath the hoop, 20 to 120 is really, really good. Um, and I already kind of spoke about why the 19 to 90 is more expensive. <laughs> And uh, it's got a bigger image circle, it can fill larger sensors, and it has, uh, it's a faster lens at T2.9, but I'm cheap. Um, Canon FD 400 millimeter 2.8. Does anybody know when this lens actually debuted? Any guesses? Before I was born. September of 1981, this lens came out. And it was still shooting Super Bowl 57 in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, this is a hell of a piece of glass along with its little brother, the 300 millimeter 2.8, um, which also was used at Super Bowl 57 and will be for, for a very, 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 very long time. Um, it's a full frame glass, just like all their L series glass is and was. Um, and I love using this lens. Now I have uh, one that was 
converted by Century Optics to have a PL mount on it. Um, again, back to Ernie. You don't get every one, but you, the ones you do are pretty special. Um, a lot of locked off stuff. The really, the legends at NFL Films like Ernie, uh, another man named Hank McElwee, who I'll, uh, I'll show a little video of, um, would, would follow that football that he just threw with a 400 millimeter prime and a two times extender, um, which is insanely, insanely difficult because remember, it's a full frame lens on Super 35 with a two times extender. So yes, it's technically an 800 millimeter lens, but on that Amira, it's a 1200 millimeter lens because of the 1.5 uh, crop factor. So you're shooting 1200 millimeters and you have no zoom. Yeah, so this is, so I harness my inner Ernie, my inner Hank, and I, I try and do this whenever I can. That's how fast they come up on you. Um, and then you, you hope to get something. So you're soft there. I couldn't find him. He was coming through the hole. And again, it's, it's so tight that it's hard to find the action. But when you do, you can kind of see here. Yeah, now I'm, I've finally caught him with focus. And then you kind of catch his speed. And so you're, you're racking, you're racking, you're racking. And then the defender's going to come, so he slows down. So now you're like, oh, well, that, that speed didn't work. So now you're trying to find it again. Then you kind of get it. That's why it's nice to shoot at 120 frames. Um, because everything slows down, so when you do get that brief moment of focus, it lasts for 12 seconds at 120 frames. Um, so again, Ernie Ernst was a legend. Rest in peace, Ernie. I think he passed away in 2013. Um, and then there was this guy who was Ernie Ernst's assistant cameraman for the Immaculate Reception, loaded all his mags, and then when Ernie retired, he handed the Photosonics camera and the 400 millimeter lens to Hank and Hank said, I'll, I'll give it a go. But I shoot, I shoot a 800 millimeter lens. I follow the ball through the air and I do all, all this tight stuff. And if, you know, my always great shots are if you can get a guy maybe on the 10 yard line at the end of the field and running straight at you and you're pulling focus and you pull focus till about here before you lose it, that to me is a pretty good shot. And you're shooting 120 20 frames a second and the shot takes three minutes. <laughs> Uh, I love Hank. So Hank was the VP of cinematography when I was an intern. Um, and this clip is actually the most I've ever heard Hank speak. Um, he is a man of very, very few words. Um, it still sends shivers down my spine to see Hank McElwee's phone number pop up on my phone on a Monday morning. Because that is a phone call you do not want to get. And it happened three times in my career. Um, back when we were shooting film, if there was a hair in the gate, He'd call you, say, hey, there was a hair in the gate. It's like, that, if any of you have shot film, you know, there's nothing you can control about it. But yes, you can, every TV timeout, pop your mag off, take a little compressed air or a toothpick and, and run it around the gate, and you can't see a hair. But he'd call and say, hey, don't make it happen. Don't let it happen again. All right, Hank. All right. It's a, it's a four-second phone call. Um, and, but he's since retired. I love him. If you look uh, on NFL Films' um, YouTube page, they just did a piece on Hank. Um, it was the 50th anniversary of the Immaculate Reception this, this past December. Franco Harris had just recently passed away, but they took Ernie's photosonic camera off the shelf where it's kind of prominently displayed in the camera department, gave it to Hank and said, go shoot the Raiders and the Steelers and Pittsburgh with it. And um, it's a great little piece because shooting a 50-year-old camera uh, in 2023, it had some issues um, jamming and, and the cold weather was like eight degrees. Um, but I love Hank and everything that he was able to do for me in my career. So, how are we doing on time? Good. Um, more art lenses. So if you had, if you were me in 2002 and you had your binoculars, if you brought those same binoculars to an NFL game today, these are other lenses you will see NFL films use. Um, this is a really interesting one. They only have one of them. Um, at NFL Films. It's the 300 millimeter prime uh, Century Series 2000 um, with these interesting drop-in filters, which I'm assuming was probably a Canon FD um, rehoused by Century, um, but it's a very, very interesting lens. A guy named Drew Mateus shoots it. Um, and that's one thing about NFL Films, like you kind of get, if you're good at something, that's Drew's lens, even though it's NFL films. Like Drew is a freelancer, and anytime you see Drew on the sidelines, he's gonna have that lens with a two times extender on it. And he's gonna do what I did 
in that first clip that I showed you at the XFL game. Essentially, just shoot tight stuff. Um, no zoom. It, it's funny how, how many prime lenses we use uh, at any given NFL game. Um, because of the way it looks, but also I love the challenge of shooting a prime lens um, and shooting sports. Um, the Optima Ultra 12 by which is a full frame uh, lens, <laughs> it's probably the heaviest lens um, in the arsenal at NFL Films, um, but it is full frame. It's always paired with the two times extender. Um, so again, you're well over 1200 millimeters on the long end, but it does have some zoom range, which is nice for Dave Malik who shoots that lens every week. Um, the Optimo 15 to 40 and the um, 45 to 120. There's a Netflix show coming out uh, this summer um, that followed this past season. We follow Patrick Mahomes, uh, Kirk Cousins, and Marcus Mariota the whole season. And one of them won a Super Bowl. Um, and so the DP, Phil Gushu, um, you, well, wanted us to just use the Optimo lenses uh, when we could. And I can't wait to see it. Um, it's, it's, it's never before seen kind of full season, every game mic'd up, home with the families, Patrick Mahomes' baby shower, like it's all documented. Um, and so I really, really can't wait for that show to debut on Netflix this summer. And what's funny, I don't know how we did it, but we shot on Amiras, which are not 4K cameras. So somehow Netflix let it slide. <laughs> shot the whole thing in 1080, probably upscaled to 4K. Um, so I did briefly talk about the 30 to 300. Uh, more recently, of course, I used this at the wild card game as a home run camera with a two times extender. So I'm 60 to 600. This is, of course, a super 35. Both of these are super 35 lenses. So I'm getting 60 to 600. Um, there's no uh, sensor zoom. Um, I, I love them both. 30 to 300 is lighter. Um, the 25 to 300 uh, is heavier. Um, but one on the right is what I shot Super Bowl 57 with, and it was, it was a blast. And I did not shoot with a two times extender. A lot of wide postcards on that 25 millimeter end. All right, that's what you all came here for, the ultimate action lens. This is, I think there's only 10 of these left. This is an Optex 33 to one, um, which I believe started its life as a Canon TV lens. Um, which then was converted to Super 16, um, which then has been since converted to 35 millimeter with that IBE optics, HD 35 kind of living in this shroud thing. Um, two camera guys in NFL Films shoot this currently because NFL Films owns two of them. Um, and Steve Andrich and Ben Johnson. Ben Johnson is a staff cinematographer with NFL Films. Steve is now um, a freelancer, but he once ran the department and purchased those two lenses in the 90s um, from someone. But uh, the 33 to one is A, hard to find, but these guys have had so many years of experience shooting it that if you go back to uh, NFL Films YouTube page and watch shots of the year, it's gonna be a whole lot of that lens following footballs that would fill this entire screen um, because, especially Steve Andrich, man, it is, it is all football. And then he pops out because you're, you're able to go wide on the zoom and absolutely beautiful stuff. If I found one, I'd love to buy it. And, and, it's, and again, it's just about reps, which is why I shoot XFL games or any football game I can because football games are hard to come by. There's 22 people on a football field with a lot of expensive equipment on them. Those don't happen every day. And so anytime I can shoot a football game and get more reps in, even after 16 years, I'm still doing it because it's what I love to do. And because uh, I'm, uh, I'm all about advocating for voices of people who don't look like me, um, I'm going to show a video of the first female staff cinematographer with NFL Films, Hannah Epstein. She is an amazing human being, but also an amazing cinematographer. This is a cool little video about Hannah. And as, as the uh, dad of three daughters, um, I want my daughters to grow up to be like Hannah. Most oh, I guess it's people had... in our department kind of specialize in a role with a camera. Some people specialize in sync sound. One play at a time, do something special. Some wires. I'm mic'd up if I ain't tell y'all. Some long lens action following the ball. 33 by. What I get to do now is 
kind of find artistic bits and pieces of what's going on on the field, which I love. Her perspective is unique, and that's what makes her special. And when your shots stand out amongst everybody else's, you can immediately tell, oh, that, that looks like a Hannah shot. An artist sees below the surface of the game and finds the storytelling shots, the really interesting stuff that helps to finish telling the story. Hannah is an artist. A lot of times she tells the story of the football game without actually shooting the game action. There's almost like no expectations with her, with how football is supposed to look or what she's seen. It's less specific plays or moments. I like to focus on really tight elements and just get facial expressions or hands or sweat, um, emotion after the play or before the play, eyeballs looking over the line of scrimmage. I like to play with negative space and use the crowd in my shots. I just love capturing the details of a game that puts you inside the game in a different way than anyone's able to see on regular broadcasts or from the stands. If you haven't watched it, Earning It is on Peacock, and it's all about females uh, in the NFL. And so I actually had to shoot, uh, I got the opportunity to shoot um, Super Bowl 55 in Tampa, peak COVID. Um, and all my job was was to follow the female ref, um, the first female ref in NFL history to um, officiate a Super Bowl. She had a microphone on and I was just up in the stands just following her around. And it was really, really special to, to be a part of that. And that is on that show on Peacock, which is really cool. Sport shooting techniques, this is just kind of some of the things that I've learned over the years. Um, backlight is your friend. If, I'm, if I walk into a stadium, uh, I'm, I want to be on the sideline where the sun is in front of me, and then that means the players are backlit um, any day of the week. Um, it just looks better, um, and again, the NFL plays a lot of uh, one o'clock games, um, which is great. When you get into college, especially here on the West Coast, there's a lot of night games, so you can't have that luxury, but um, backlit is your friend. Um, follow focus direction. So in that clip on the 400 millimeter stuff, which I will try and go back to here, um, I have a couple things. That follow focus unit actually can be reversed, and I didn't know it. So whenever I would want the direction that I want, which is play goes away from you, I want to focus away from my face. Play comes towards me, I want to focus towards my face. Um, if I was to set that up on the lower rails, it would be opposite, and that would mess with my brain. And so I mounted it from the top because that is a, one way to reverse your um, follow focus. Uh, I have since learned <laughs> that there's a little thumb screw on that particular airy uh, follow focus that I could just unscrew and then flip the handle to the other side. Um, so you live and learn. I'm always learning. Um, but so as he runs towards me, you watch my hand start coming towards my face, and that's how I want every lens I shoot to be set up. Um, and so Nikon has a reverse focus direction than Canon and Fujinon, um, and so that's when you play with your follow focus setup and uh, switch it. Um, and so it's not for everybody. There are some guys who like it the opposite way, um, but most NFL films guys, if they're using a follow focus unit, want the direction to Play goes away, you go away, play comes toward you, you come toward you. I shoot. Oh, there's a reverse gear. So Andrich has his focus unit. He's not mounting it to the top like my silly butt, um, but he's got this reverse gear that if he was to clip this in would be backwards. Now they've added that reverse gear to make it correct. It's another way to reverse the, fo the focus direction on your follow focus. There's Hannah. Follow focus direction, done. Get low. Um, as someone who's six foot three, this is hard to do because I get taller and bigger every year. Or I don't get taller, but I get bigger every year. <laughs> um, and so knee pads are my friend. Um, hi hats are my friend. But there's something about, um, especially with football, you know, just like in any cinema, you get low, it's godlike, right? Everybody's just larger than life when you're lower. So shooting up at them kind of makes everything better. Um, and so getting low, whether that's even handheld. So I, I rarely shoot standing up. I'm usually 
crouch down on my knees, um, which gets old <laughs> when you get old. Um, but again, I have, a, I have quite the knee pad set up uh, to help uh, extend my career. Um, behind the action offers unique angles um, as much as it does in front, you know? And so um, that XFL clip that I kind of showed at the beginning, a lot of stuff was happening behind the line of scrimmage. Um, and just keep that in mind, is that sometimes behind the action is, is better. Um, when, football specifically, um, the QB opens up to the camera. It, it, again, we talk about backlight. So if the sun's over here, I want to be on that sideline. Um, and in a perfect world, the quarterback is right-handed and he's going that way. And so when I'm here, his chest opens up to my camera. Best shots uh, are usually captured that way. Now, if he's left-handed, rarely am I going to switch sides because if it is a daytime game, I like backlit more than I like QB opening up to me. So I kind of backlight usually depicts my position on the field. And in NFL stadiums, almost all NFL stadiums run north to south. And so it's typically the away sideline sits in the sun. The home sideline gets the shade. So I'm on the away sideline most, most times, often not. When you're shooting regular season, do you have like set teams? No, it's, it, it, it's pretty regionalized now, um, especially ever since COVID, you know, travel was limited during that time, but really, really regionalized. And so I, I stick on the West Coast for the regular season. Then as teams go into the playoffs, travel um, where they need me. Um, yes, but not very bad. There's, if you look on YouTube, there's a lot of cameramans getting creamed. And um, one of those first slides, I had Vernon Davis like leap over me, which if I was standing up, it would have been over. But I was kneeling down, and he's an athlete, so he jumped over me. So that was good. That was in 2011 after a touchdown. Um, but yeah, I, and the older I get, too, I bail quicker. You know, The shot is not worth it, especially my expensive camera and my expensive lenses. And even the NFL, they will, if they were in this room, they'd tell you player safety is number one. Get out of the way. Get out of the way. I don't care about the shot. I don't care about anything. Get out of the way. Let the player go. Um, because, you know. Well, yeah. <laughs> they say it's to protect a player, but I don't want to be hit by a player either. And again, the older I get, younger in my career, I'd stay in there and get the shot. But now I got three kids and a wife and, yeah. I don't need to get hurt. Yeah, so she, uh, it's actually in, uh, as I'm talking and answering questions, and I'll turn the sound off, I'll play Shots of the Year, because we're all friends here, and I'm sure the NFL doesn't like me playing all these clips, but they're on YouTube, so whatever. Um, let me turn the audio down. And, and that Dob shot is actually one of the Shots of the Year. Um, yeah, but, so, if you put yourself in those shoes, do, do you pan up, do you, you know, like, you see what happens, and, and sometimes you'll see her shoot, and then she'll just look up, but the camera's still on the hi-hat. She uses the 85 to 300 Fujinon with the two times extender every single game. Um, and yeah, but it's her staying in there. There's one shot here that she had um, where, man, I would have racked, but she didn't, and it actually makes the shot better. Um, it's, it's a Dolphins game where Josh Allen kind of steps back and throws it, and it's like, are you going to rack? Are you going to rack? And she's like, nope, I'm not going to rack. <laughs> um, and it all happened so quick. You saw that clip of the Fresno State running back. Like, everything happened so quick. So it, it's easy to, to critique it at, at 120 frames when we're watching it here. But when it happens, you're like, God, that's a split-second decision, you know? Um, so, yeah, a lot of 23 by, 24 by, 85 to 300, probably the 180 there, 33 by. Um, yeah, 33 by. That's Hannah. So... It's hard to say, but yes, it, it, it's almost, that's all Hannah right there. That's, that's a Hannah shot. Hannah right there. Doesn't even move the frame. Quarterback happens to run back through. It's like, yes, this is the one. I'm like, are you going to rack? Are you going to rack? Are you going to rack? Nope. It actually makes it better. So, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, so, you know, depending on how many cameras are there with me, you know, if I'm the only ground shooter, I want to make sure I'm going to get put my wide angle lens on, maybe get some fans kind of coming in. Because again, back to what Steve Sable had said, like it's, it's about the story. So how am, I, how am I telling the story of this particular football game? Because there's a dude in the press box and there's me on the field. Um, and so how do I do that? Well, 
you, you don't, have, don't know how the game's going to go, so I get some of the opposing fans kind of coming in with their star jerseys on, and then, of course, the home team and their jerseys. And, um, and so pregame, I've got that kind of ritual. Um, if there's more cameras, then, then I know what everybody else is kind of doing, and then I'll try and get something that they're not getting. Um, and so it's, it's kind of in my head. And again, it goes back to I, I've done a lot of editing. So what, what would an editor want to see? you know, that they're not going to see. Um, and, and it can get, you know, monotonous every week, especially if you shoot only the 49ers. And so you're dealing with Levi Stadium every week. How do I make this place look special? Well, then the weather plays into that. Is it raining? Is it sunny? Is it snowing? Um, and so just trying to, Austin Porter, 23 by, 24 by. Um, so yes, it's kind of like this mental shot list for doing it for so many years. Um, and then we do have weekly calls. And so we're all, as a freelance crew on getting on a call with the NFL and they're kind of talking about the storylines. They sent us a little bit of a storyline of the game um, before the game. So you're just kind of familiar with what's going on. Like, oh, FYI, so-and-so was traded earlier in the year. Now he's playing against his former team. This head coach used to be the assistant coach here. So we get a little bit of those bylines so we kind of can get those shots. Um, but yeah, it's mentally. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah, they're using those, uh, those full frame Sony cameras. Um, usually like an A7S III or FX3 on a gimbal. Um, and then and somehow it's being transmitted back to their truck, um, which is amazing um, if you've ever tried to do that. Um, but yeah, I think, and to me, it, a little bit of course of what we've been doing for years, but also the video game world and Madden. Um, Madden hired an NFL film cinematographer, plucked him out of NFL films, hired them, moved him to Orlando and said, teach us about cinematography and how we can put cinematography into Madden. And so you, you watch Madden, there's shallow depth of field, um, and when you, when you replay a, game, replay a, a, a play, um, you can control the cameras and things are in a focus and out of focus. Well, that's because they, they literally handpicked an NFL film cinematographer and put him on staff and said, we want it to look pretty. And so then that then evolved to Fox and CBS and NBC going with their full frame, shallow depth of field. They do use a lot of autofocus because it's, hey, if it's there, use it. Um, but they're, they're handing it to guys who are traditional, like shoulder mounted shooters. So they're like, what are, what are we doing? So for the first couple of years, it was kind of clunky, but I think they're really getting the hang of it now. And so they're replacing full steady cam rigs with gimbals and full frame mirrorless cameras. And so it's, it's pretty amazing. Questions? Yeah. Uh, not that I know of it from the NFL, but it's something that is like, intrigues me like at what point could a camera do what austin porter does or what steve andrich does like we're, we're going to be there you know it'll be on a little remote control car and it'll have something in the ball and it'll just do it that would be cool i would take my job away but it would be pretty cool um and so i don't think the nfl i haven't heard anything from the nfl again but um i'm super intrigued with it and i i think we're on the cusp of that you know with robotic cameras and I didn't see him. That's pretty cool. Could they track a football? I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to go by the booth. I got to go by there. That's cool. Um, yeah, again, I think we're right on the cusp of that. Um, and of course, you know, COVID kind of sped up a lot of things in that technology world where, you know, you couldn't have cameramen on the field or very few. Um, and so I'm not the type of camera person that's afraid of that technology. I'd embrace it and say, like, let, let's do it. Like, you know, again, talk about player safety. If it's a little thing on a hi-hat, let it do it. And then, you know, I mean, really the bread and butter is access for NFL films than any other company that's associated it. It's even the team, the team video crews, like it's access, man. That's what people want to see. And so when you have that access, that's what people want to see. So yes, the shots are great, but as long as you have the access to the players and the microphones on players and all that, you're, you're going to be employed for a long time. Um, a little bit heavier. The, the Amira um, is just I pro probably slightly heavier. Man, that's a good, great question. It might be the same weight now that I think about it. But because um, the Amira is just a sensor, it's actually just a lot of dead space. If you, you can see through kind of like the, the air grates in there, you're like, there's nothing in there. It's like a sensor at the beginning, some fans, and then some audio boards in the back. And they're like, it's really just built for the shoulder. It's an Alexa Mini built on for a shoulder rig, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, we use the same the 24 by 23 by 22 by on you know as as our main action cameras. But yes, because it's Super 35, 
If we wanted to get the art lenses, now they're bigger. So yeah. Thank you for coming. Enjoy the last day of NAB and travel home safe.